Hello, hello. Yep, it's me again. Thank you very much for dropping in to listen to this lecture series. My name is Professor Andrew Timming, and I am the author of this textbook, Applied Statistics, Business and Management Research. I hope you are enjoying reading the book and listening to the lecture series. Now, in the previous lecture, you might recall that we covered the different types of variables that statisticians use in their statistical analyses. There were three basic ways of measuring variables that we talked about, nominal, ordinal, and scale. Now, recall that nominal variables like gender are categorical and non-hierarchical. Ordinal variables like job satisfaction are categorical and hierarchical. And scale variables like age are hierarchical and metric, meaning that they do not need to be coded because the response categories are meaningful in and of themselves. We also talked briefly about the difference between independent or predictor variables and dependent or outcome variables taking care never to imply that an independent variable causes a dependent variable. It's fine to say that the variables are associated with one another or correlated with one another, but it's not okay to use the language of causality. Now, in this lecture, we'll talk about measurement error, questionnaire design, survey administration, and sampling. We'll also review what we learned over the last three lectures. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, here is once again the textbook that we'll be using in this lecture. We're still on chapter one, which is called Introduction to Statistics. There are three aspects associated with the measurement of variables that I need you to understand before we move forward. These are reliability, validity, and measurement error. Let's take them one at a time so you can see what I mean by each. Firstly, measurement error refers to the difference between the reality of a construct or variable and the way in which we have measured it. Now, ideally, we want to construct items that give us accurate responses to what we're trying to measure. But from time to time, sometimes through fault of our own and sometimes through no fault of our own, we are going to measure items that deviate from the reality of what we're trying to measure. So let me give you an example of measurement error. Let's say you design a questionnaire and one of the items asks the respondents, what is your income in dollars? Now that question may seem pretty straightforward and one that will not result in a lot of measurement error, but what if you administer it to a sample in which some respondents respond in US dollars, others in Australian dollars, and yet others in Hong Kong dollars. Now the researcher may assume that all of the responses are in US dollars, but clearly that's not the case. So in this example, we have a clear cut case of what we call measurement error in our variables. Reliability is also important in the measurement of variables. Reliability refers to the consistency or the replicability of a measured variable. So this means that if you measure a particular variable once using a particular item, and then you measure it again, either in the same sample or in a different sample, you'll get similar responses each time. So an, a variable or a set of variables that have low levels of, reliab of reliability are such that the responses change quite dramatically from sample to sample. There is a statistical method, a statistical test called Cronbach's alpha that will give us some sense of the reliability of a set of items. It doesn't work on one single item, but if you have a set of items, that are meant to measure a particular construct, you can calculate a Cronbach's alpha. And generally we're speaking, if the resultant score is above 0 0.700, then that indicates a reasonably good level of reliability. The closer you get to one, 
the more reliable your measure is. Validity is slightly different from reliability. Validity refers to the question of whether you're measuring what you think you are measuring, right? So uh, you might think that you're measuring, for example, IQ, intelligence, but you're not really measuring IQ, you're really measuring test-taking abilities or the uh, cultural context in which an individual is taking that IQ test. Now, there are some statistical methods that we can use to assess validity, and we will examine some of them much later in this book and in this lecture series. I'm thinking of methods like exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis. But for now, I think the important thing is if you want to ensure good validity, you just need to put some good old fashioned theoretical scrutiny into the items that you are designing and measuring. So let's talk about questionnaire design principles. These are some best practices that I have identified that you should follow in the design of your questionnaire should you be in a position of collecting your own primary data. Let's take them one by one. First point is that surveys should be theory driven. I've seen this mistake made a lot. A researcher simply puts together a few variables that he or she thinks might be interesting or important, but then after collecting the data, it's found out that they actually aren't that important or that you missed a very important variable that should have been included but wasn't included. This is why before designing your questionnaire, you should have a good look at the literature on this topic so you can get a comprehensive understanding of what potentially is going on. And only with that comprehensive understanding can you then decide to build your questionnaire or your survey. Second point, the layout should be clear and not cluttered. Again, this is a classic mistake that researchers make. You want to make sure that respondents can easily fill out the survey because you are making a demand of their time. And if the survey is difficult to follow or quite cluttered, they're more likely to drop out or simply not respond in the first instance when they see how cluttered and long the survey is. Third, strike a balance with the length of the instrument. This is always a difficult one. As a researcher, you want to get as much data as possible. But at the same time, you need to be mindful of the fact that very, very long questionnaires are often subject to high levels of attrition, meaning that people drop out along the way. So ideally, it would be great if you could collect uh, data or information from a survey that lasted two hours, but very few people are going to sit for two hours and fill out a survey. In fact, many people uh, reach the point of wanting to end the survey after five or ten minutes. So you want to get as much data as possible, but be mindful of the fact that respondents, after a certain amount of time, will disengage. Items should be short and simple. This is also an important one. Academics like to use big, long sentences and big, fancy words. This is a huge mistake, especially when you're designing a survey. You want to be as parsimonious as possible in developing an item to measure. You want to say as much as you possibly can in as few words as possible. Next, avoid leading questions, right? You want to ask neutral questions in order to get at the reality of how respondents feel about a particular item or variable. If you're asking leading questions, you're sort of inviting the response that you're expecting or that you want to see in your particular study. So an example would be, uh, you know, something along the lines of, you're not really satisfied in this work, are you? Versus how satisfied are you in this job? Right? You can see the difference in terms of how respondents are gonna read those questions. Next. Response categories should be exhaustive and mutually exclusive. Exhaustive means that every possible option is included as a response category, that you're not excluding something that someone would want to say. 
and mutually exclusive means that there's no overlap across the response categories, that they are all qualitatively different because if there's overlap, a respondent might not know which category to choose. So it's very important that you pay attention to the exhaustive and mutually exclusive nature of a survey. Next, respondents should be qualified to answer the questions, right? You want to make sure that your survey is asking questions that are relevant to the life experience of the respondents. Right? If you're interested in uh, a survey on uh, Albanian foreign policy towards China, you might not want to ask respondents from South Africa. Right? It simply wouldn't make sense. You want to make sure that the items speak to the lived experience of the respondents. Items must not be double-barreled. So double-barreled items are items that actually ask two questions in one single item. And this can often be confusing for the respondent because they might feel one way about one thing, but a different way about a different thing in the item, and then they're unsure how to respond. So I guess this goes back to the point I made earlier about short and simple items. Next, complex constructs often require multiple items, right? So instead of asking a single question to measure a particular variable, some complex constructs might require multiple items and then you can aggregate those to get a better understanding of that construct or variable. An example might be job satisfaction. You could ask a single question, how satisfied are you with your job on a scale of say one to five, and that might give you some sense of job satisfaction, but a better measurement would be to ask a series of questions about different dimensions of job satisfaction. For example, how satisfied are you in your ability to work autonomously in this organization? How satisfied are you in your pay? How satisfied are you with your opportunities for training and development, et cetera, et cetera? So if you put multiple items into a survey and then you aggregate them at the end, you sometimes end up with a better measurement. Finally, the last point here is that survey instruments should always be piloted. This means that you should find a small sample to test your survey out before you administer to your big sample, your final sample. By piloting the survey, you can identify errors that you might have made in designing your questionnaire and then change those errors before you go to the full sample. Let's assume that you have designed your survey instrument, right? You've designed your questionnaire, perhaps you've piloted on a small group of, of individuals, and now you're ready to actually administer your survey so that you can collect your data. There are four basic methods of survey administration that you should be familiar with. These include face-to-face -face administration, telephone-based administration, postal administration, and increasingly online administration of the survey. Each of these methods has costs and benefits, advantages and disadvantages. And so it's a good idea to take them one by one so that you can get a feel for these. Let's begin with face-to-face -face administration. Administering a survey face-to-face -face gives the highest quality data, but it's also very expensive. It gives the highest quality data because you have essentially an individual there with the respondent, with the participant, oftentimes reading the survey to them and then marking down the answers. So obviously people are much less likely to leave the survey midway or even decline to take part in the survey in the first instance if there's an individual there asking them to participate. But it's also expensive. As you can imagine, if you have a very large sample, say 2,000 respondents that you need, that means that an individual or set of individuals is going to have to talk to those 2,000 respondents. And that can be quite difficult if the sample is quite geographically dispersed. But by far, this is the highest quality data. Telephone-based administration, this is the second type. This type of administration gives reasonably high quality data 
at a reasonably low cost, but there's a few problems associated with this method, and number one is that very few people have landlines these days, right? It used to be that everyone had a landline and you could call to most households and someone would pick up and you could administer a survey to them. But these days, very few people have landlines and the ones that have mobile phones, usually there are rules or regulations against researchers or marketers from calling someone's mobile phone to administer a survey. It's high quality data. It's a reasonably low cost is, and I guess that makes sense in the sense that as with the previous example of face to face, via telephone, you don't have to be there face to face. You don't have to travel geographically across the whole country in order to administer your survey. So you can simply sit there on the phone and collect the data. Next is postal administration. Very few people use this method anymore. In fact, it's almost entirely disappeared. Not entirely, which is why I included it, but almost entirely. Administering a survey by post is quite inexpensive, but it often yields to low response rates and low quality data. It's inexpensive in the sense that the only cost essentially is printing your, your survey and purchasing the envelopes and then the postage and then including prepaid postage to return the survey. But response rates are low, right? It's easy for someone to get a letter and simply throw it into the trash. And the data quality also tends to be low in the sense that people will get a survey and fill out maybe a couple items and then give up. Lastly is online administration. And this is increasingly the case that researchers are using online based methods of administration. This is by far the cheapest means of survey administration. Uh, in some cases, it could be considered even free, but it also yields the lowest quality data, generally speaking, even lower than postal data. But for the same reasons, if someone gets an email with a link to a survey, it's very, very easy simply to click delete rather than to take the time to fill out that survey. Now, there are two basic types of sampling. So this is the method by which you choose individuals to respond to your survey. The first method is random sampling and the second is non-random sampling. Random sampling, for reasons that will be made clear as we progress in this book, is by far preferable to non-random sampling. And the reason is that random sampling implies that every single respondent in a sampling frame has an equal probability of being included in the final sample. And therefore, a random sample tends to look and behave much more like the population than a non-random sample, right? So this is another way of saying that random samples are more generalizable than non-random samples. There are a few different methods of random sampling. This includes simple random sampling. So this would be, for example, uh, if you have a population of say 1000 people and you wish to take a sample of say 100 of those, you can use a random number generator, number each, each potential person from one to a thousand, and then use the random number generator to randomly pick out individuals from that sampling frame until you reach 100 participants. Random digit dialing is a, again, more archaic form of sampling since, as I mentioned before, many do not use telephone-based sampling anymore. But essentially, this method involves randomly putting together phone numbers until you reach someone's telephone. Systematic random sampling involves, for example, taking every so many cases of a population of a sampling frame. So let's say you have a sampling frame of 2000 people and you take every 20th case on that list. Stratified random sampling is a form of random sampling where the groups included in the sample may be over or underrepresented so that you can include uh, certain underrepresented groups in the analysis more easily. Uh, a good example might be, for example, if you're doing a study of 
LGBTIQ employees, if you take a random sample, you might get, oh, maybe about 15% of the population in that category. But if you wish to compare LGBTIQ employees with non-LGBTIQ employees, it might make sense to have those 50-50 in your sample, in which case you're going to overrepresent LGBTIQ and underrepresent heterosexual uh, respondents. But nevertheless, you're using a random sample method to collect those data. Then we have multi-stage area probability sampling. This is uh, kind of an interesting method. So for example, it unfolds across different stages. Stage one, let's say you take a random sample of 25 states from the 50 American states. And then at stage two, within each of those states, you take a random sample of counties. And then within each county, you take a random sample of households. And then within each household, you take a random sample of individuals. So this is what I mean by multi-stage. Non-random sampling uh, is, again, something that is best to avoid because those samples don't look and behave like our population. But examples might be, for example, purposive sampling. This is uh, simply seeking out people that you think would be uh, adequate respondents for your survey. It's quite haphazard. Snowball sampling is finding one respondent and asking that person to refer you to another and then asking that person to refer you to another and so on. And then quota sampling is a lot like the stratified random sampling, but purely non-random. So you might want to have particular quotas in your sample and you simply identify them as best you can. Okay, we've reached the end of chapter one, the end of the third lecture in this lecture series. And let's review very briefly what we've learned so far. So we've talked about the difference between quantitative versus qualitative methods, where qualitative methods are more narrative-based and quantitative methods are more metric-based. We've looked at variable measurement and types of variables. Remember our nominal, ordinal, and scale level variables and our independent variables versus our dependent variables. We've talked about the importance of coding and quantification of our ideas. We quantify our ideas because we can't mathematically analyze ideas, but we can mathematically analyze numbers. So we take our ideas and we turn them into numbers. We talked a bit about survey design and item construction, looking at some best practices in that regard. We talked about the importance of minimizing measurement error when measuring our variables and maximizing the extent to which our variables are reliable, that is to say replicable, as well as valid, that is to say that our variables measure what we think they're measuring. And then finally, we've talked about the four key methods of survey administration and the various types of random and non-random sampling. Having now completed the lecture series for chapter one, it might make sense for you to take some time to pause this lecture and try and answer the six questions that you see on the screen. These will help you digest and better understand the material that you've just learned. Thank you very much for those of you who have attended all three of these lectures associated with chapter one. I hope you enjoyed them and I look forward to seeing you again in chapter two.